Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1661. How are you beautiful people doing today? I hope you're well, because... I got some bad news for you. <laughs> Our installed president, Mr. Biden, planning the biggest tax increase in three decades. Yes, Bloomberg reports that tax rates might rise to pay for the next White House initiative. <laughs> well, surprise, surprise, surprise. Oh, Sleepy Joe, come on. We knew you were going to do this. We knew this was coming. And uh, you are going to want to make sure you only make $399,999 a year. Because if you go to $400,000, they're going to hit you really hard. They're going to increase the corporate tax rate. They're going to increase, and, and that means, you know, those big giant corporations, they probably won't be very affected. And if they are... All they'll do is raise their prices. Hashtag inflation coming through your way because corporations are a pass-through entity. But the small businesses that compete in a more difficult, more competitive environment, they will find it hard to pass those tax hikes through to the consumer. And the big companies, you know, they do the double Irish twist. It is St. Paddy's Day, after all, by the way. Don't be spreading the blarney today. Happy St. Paddy's Day to all. Hope you're wearing your green. I must admit, I am not wearing green today because the one green shirt that I own, I couldn't find it. Not that I looked very hard, but I'm just saying, I couldn't find it. So here in the office today, with all of these people... No one pinched me for not wearing green. So I've made it so far. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right. And, I, and I'm sure you're, I, I'm sure very few of you are in a big office with a whole bunch of people because nowadays we work remotely, which has created big new real estate opportunities for all of us investors, hasn't it? And back to Biden and his tax increase, make more than a million bucks. You're going to pay a higher capital gains tax, and the estate tax is going to be expanded if he gets his way. Uh, so a lot of tax hikes coming your way, folks. What is the most tax-favored asset class in America? Income property. Income property. So we can help you with that. But yours truly, I did another thing that I've been researching, toying with, thinking about for about 10 years, never pulled the trigger until last year. I spent a lot of time researching this at the end of the year and a lot of time dealing with it in January, frankly, but I set up my own insurance company. Now, I'm thinking of doing one of our monthly empowered investor calls on this topic. Or maybe we'll do a public web class on it. I'm not sure. But it is pretty interesting. You do have to have your own business. And your own business needs to be, you know, doing a, a bit of revenue to sort of make it work and make the extra cost work. But I must tell you, as I have said before, insurance is a interesting, interesting business. Why? As I have been saying for the last decade, I have mentioned this even though this is not an insurance show. I have mentioned to you the idea that is quite fascinating. That the insurance business is possibly, I think it is the only, but I say possibly because whenever I'm talking to 
a large group of people, such as yourself, someone always fact-checks me, and they call me out, and they, they write me an email, and they say, Jason, you are wrong, wrong, wrong about this. So I have come to self-censor a bit, <laughs> be more careful, uh, which is not all bad. <laughs> not all bad, I, I will be the first to admit. But the insurance business is the only business in the world with a negative cost of capital. I want you to really let that one sit in for a moment. A negative cost of capital. Think about it. If you're an insurance company, what do you do? You receive money before you spend money. I mean, on actual cost of goods, right? Like a normal business, you make your widgets, you spend the money, maybe you're making maple syrup, maybe you're making shoes, I don't know, whatever you're making, right, in your business. You're spending money to make that, and then you sell it in the marketplace, and you get money back, and hopefully you earn a nice profit by creating a win-win transaction where the consumers want your stuff, and you have enough pricing power to where you can charge a good price to make you a, a reasonable profit for your efforts. You have a positive cost of capital because you had to spend the money before you could bring the money in, before you could bring the revenue in. But insurance, you receive the money as a shared risk premium before you pay out the claims. So it is an interesting industry and it's got interesting tax structures. And I think if you tell me, if you go to jasonhartman.com slash ask, jasonhartman.com slash ask, and you say, Jason, tell me more about how I could be in the insurance business and shelter more money than I'm just sheltering on my income properties alone and escape the wrath of Joe Biden and communist Harris. I mean, Kamala Harris, communist Harris. Which one is it? Okay. Communist. Let's call her communist. Okay. <laughs> so if you're interested, let us know. Tell your investment counselor. I'll do a class on this because I spent about a decade researching this, thinking about it. You know me. I'm not quick with all my decisions. I am a Libra after all. As great of a sign as Libra is, and let me tell you, Libra is a really good sign. They have one flaw. They're a bit indecisive. I mean, I used to be indecisive, and now I'm just not sure. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. So maybe we'll do a, a, a class on that. At least for the Empowered Investor Network, we'll do that. And by the way, Empowered Investor members, we put a new vintage recording. We have, we had our archaeologist team. Yes, we have a team of archaeologists over here. And they dug up 238, I kid you not, we don't really have archaeologists, but we did dig up 238 vintage recordings from 10 plus years ago. And we are now putting those vintage recordings into the Empowered Investor Network. So as part of your membership, as a surprise bonus, we put one in there yesterday that is on due diligence. Good subject. Good subject, due diligence. So uh, check that out, Empowered Investors. If you're not a member, well, reach out to us and uh, we'll let you know how you can become one. All right. Our guest today is one of our wonderful clients and also in the Hero League as a uh, uh, medical professional. Our guest today will be talking about his client case study. So we always appreciate when you clients come on the show. If you're out there listening and you're thinking, hey, I want to come on the show. Just reach out to us. We'll be glad to have you on because we always love hearing client case studies. The good, the bad, and the ugly. We want to help our other clients learn from your successes, your challenges, and everything in between. So we will have that in a few minutes. But first, I do want to talk to you for a moment about debt to GDP ratio because I have noticed something. I have noticed that... And maybe, maybe I'm just more sensitive to it. Maybe I'm trapped in algorithm echo chamber. We all have to be careful of that today because the powers that be are listening to us, of course, 
the hot mic on your cell phone that's always on, the hot mic on your computer, your TV, your A-L-E-X-A devices if you have them. They're listening to you, they're reading your mind, they're looking where you click on your mouse and looking at what you surf on the internet, and uh, they're doing all this stuff, right? So you might be trapped in an algorithm echo chamber. Maybe I just coined that phrase. Hmm, did I just coin that phrase? I might have. Anyway, algorithm echo chamber with a little TM after it for trademark. <laughs> so I might be caught in that, but I have noticed that there's a lot a lot, 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 lot more talk about inflation expectations now than even a month or two months ago. From not just the people that are usually saying that. No, not just Peter Schiff, the sky is falling, it's the end of the world. He's been saying that for decades. But a lot more mainstream. This inflation expectation really seems to be headed to the forefront. And it's definitely related to the debt to GDP ratio of a country. So the gross domestic product, the economy's value in any given year, right? Versus the debt that country has. Well, we all know Japan is the worst. It has the highest uh, debt to GDP ratio, and that is about 230%. Next in line, Greece. They're at about 200%. Greece is an epic disaster. Japan is sort of a disaster in a different way because of its demography and various other things. But at least in Japan, you have hardworking, really smart people. In Greece, you got people that like to be a lot more leisurely. Okay, so it's a very different environment than Japan. Next in line, you still got some leisurely people, and I've got quite a bit of this blood in my genetic background, and that's Italy, okay? You can say a lot of things about yours truly, but you definitely can't say I'm lazy. <laughs> no one's ever going to be able to say that. But Italy, they like leisure over there. La dolce vita, you know, the life of indolence and self-indulgence. La dolce vita. About 150% debt to GDP ratio. Italy is in big trouble. Amazingly, Singapore. Now, Singapore, that is a country of winners, okay? And Singapore got ahead so much and, and rose up so much over several decades because of its very libertarian policies. It really, really zoomed ahead because of that, and it's, it's really a marvelous, incredible country. Portugal, another sort of leisurely country, debt-to-GDP ratio, about 130. And guess who is next in line? Guess who's next in line? The good old U.S. of A. With about 120% debt-to-GDP ratio. I'm pretty sure that's the highest it's ever been, ever. Even post-World War II, fact check me, I could be wrong about that one because I'm, I'm not looking at anything that would tell me that now. After the U.S., we've got France, Spain, Belgium, Canada, a.k.a. Canada, <laughs> Argentina. Argentina has so many other problems besides their debt-to-GDP ratio. We've got the U.K., Brazil, India, South Africa, Hong Kong, even though it's not a country, Germany, Ireland, China, Poland, Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand, Turkey, Mexico, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Indonesia, Switzerland, Russia. Russia has pretty low debt-to-GDP ratio. So that indicates, that is an inflationary indicator. There are others, but that is definitely one of them. And all of these countries are running up the debt. And the USA has extraordinarily high debt. Remember, just in the last year, about a third of all the dollars ever printed, ever, right? You got that as ever, like in the country's history, what, 240 years-ish, give or take? Printed last year, in one year. So, folks, there are many more indicators out there showing that there is definitely inflationary pressure in the system. And we like that. As real estate investors, as income property investors, 
we're fine with that because we will be enriched through inflation while others will be hurt by inflation. So that is part of my inflation-induced debt destruction strategy. If you want to learn more about that, go to jasonhartman.com, type in inflation-induced debt destruction. I know it's a long phrase, but it works. And check out some of the prior episodes on that and some of the blog posts and articles on that. Okay, without further ado, let's get to our guest and let's hear his client case study. Hey, we always get great feedback from you whenever we do client case studies. And so we really appreciate volunteers like our guest today, Andrew Freitas, who's with us. He's got seven properties. He lives in Vancouver, Washington, and uh, has been working with one of our investment counselors and uh, really just a pleasure to have him on the show. Andrew, welcome. How are you? I'm quite well. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. Good. It's good to have you. So, you know, maybe we'll start at kind of the beginning. First off, what attracted you to real estate investing? I've always kind of known that real estate would be something that I would want to, some vehicle to pursue, you know, for income. Um, My parents told me, they even owned a business when I was growing up, a little coffee shop. And they told me that even with that for 15 years or so, the only money they ever made was actually owning their own houses and having them appreciate and and then selling them and moving somewhere else. And they were very lucky in their life of some good appreciating markets that they happened to be moving into at the time. Um, Then they had a rental property for a while and they were of the old style of letting the property pay itself off, you know, and just have it be free and clear. And I mean, it worked well for them. It worked fine. Um, And again, that's the money in their life that they've made, even though they've worked really hard and and been diligent workers. They, uh, their their, their actual income or wealth has been because of real estate. And so I was never really uh, afraid of real estate as a thing. My brother also has in this area remodeled houses. Um, He's bought his own places and remodeled them, flipped them and done the work himself and, Mm -hmm. and also done some buy and hold stuff. So I knew real estate, I was never afraid of real estate as a thing. You know, it was never like, a. it didn't feel like a risk to me as a concept, as a vehicle for wealth. So yeah, that's kind of how I, as a child or as a kid even was not afraid of it. Good stuff. You know, uh, just to, to mention something on that, you talked about your parents and the business they owned and, you know, how really the money they made was on real estate. And yeah. you made me think of something, uh, of a friend of mine who uh, was uh, had, a, had a, a very wealthy uh, parents. He said to me something interesting. And, you know, I'm not really a fan of commercial real estate, mostly. Mm-hmm. I think housing is really the key. You know, single family homes being my favorite, apartments being my second favorite, mobile home parks also good but housing, right? Not office space or retail so much. You can make money in anything, but I just think the housing assets the best. I said to him, you know, how'd how'd your dad get so successful? You know, what's his secret sauce in business? And he said, you know, interestingly, he didn't really make his money from the businesses. Mm -hmm. He just made his money from all the real estate the businesses occupied. (laughs) I thought thought that was interesting. You know, the business kind of just becomes the tenant, right? Mm -hmm. And it pays the mortgage, but it's really the properties that made the money. And and then, you know, they purchased a whole bunch of houses and did stuff outside the businesses directly, too. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I thought that was sort of an interesting aside. Yeah. And my parents never owned the commercial properties that the, their coffee shops were in. You know, right. that was never probably even in their thoughts at the time, right. you know. Yeah. Um, but they certainly, the, the home they lived in, it was nice, you know. Yeah. And again, that's, as you talk about, that's kind of the, the icing on the cake. And and for them, it just happened to, they just, luck of the draw year after year, they kept getting in the, the right markets. What can I say? Yeah. And you, and you live near the place where they pretty much invented coffee in America. <laughs> so Yeah. Quite, yeah. quite a lot up here. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Good stuff. When did you discover the uh, Creating Wealth podcast? I lived over in Sweden for about seven years. Uh, my wife is from Sweden. And 2009, I was painting my roof. They're metal roofs over there. You got to, sometimes you got to paint them. And I was a do-it-yourselfer kind of a guy. So I was up on my roof, scraping off paint and, and painting. I had downloaded or had ripped some, some CDs that I had had of real estate investing prior to this onto an MP3 player. And uh, it was 2009. And my, my friend had just gotten the first iPhone in the States. And he sent me his iPod Touch. So I like had this new cool device that I don't even know if it was available in my town in Sweden, you know, up in the north of Sweden. Um, and so I kind of got in, I, oh, podcasts, you know, iTunes and all that kind of stuff. And so I was looking for something else to listen to, you know, real estate. I was listening to the real estate thing and I was like, hmm. So I discovered you through uh, a searching on the, whatever it is, iTunes store, whatever it is now, you know, the podcast and just, um, yeah, I had heard a couple different ones and what you were talking about just resonated with me. And so mm-hmm. that was that, the first That's one. great. Yeah. I don't even know what number of episodes you were back in 2009, but 
I think it was probably still in the double digits, maybe in the low 100s by then. Yeah, in 2009, I don't know either offhand, yeah. but uh, but we have a lot more episodes now. So yeah. you discovered us about 12 years ago then. Mm -hmm. How long did you listen to the podcast before, uh, you know, reaching out and becoming a client? Yeah, so I kind of did off and on, you know, um, kind of had some periods of time where I just wasn't listening to anything. I was doing, you know, hunker down, nose to the grind, doing my own stuff. And I think 2013 was when I attended Meet the Masters and it was in Irvine. And, you know, if I'm just being transparent, I thought it was a cool event, but I don't know, maybe I just wasn't ready for it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I kind of knew that was still a vehicle. You're, you're, the concepts you were talking about so certainly resonated with me. I thought Platinum Properties, Jason Arman, I thought that was the way to go. But I was like, I just... I'm not quite ready yet. You know, maybe that was just a risk thing. I was nervous about jumping in the pool. Who knows? But uh, 2013 was my first like event with you and, and I enjoyed it. You know, it was nice mm -hmm. getting out of the gloomy Pacific Northwest and in January as well. You get down to right. coming down to uh, Southern California. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That wasn't a bad thing. But then in 2000, um, I think 2016. Yeah, December of 16 is when I bought my first property through you all. And uh, that was my first investment property. And then like I bought one in 17, then one in 18. And then I had cashed out a retirement plan because I was working for the, the local county here and I um, had some sort of vested retirement plan kind of thing. And I was like, this is ridiculous. They decided to like protect people and start choosing what investments you could and couldn't do and taking a portion right. of your investments and making it less risky. And I'm like, I just want to go all in. You know, I'm not, I'm not a conservative investor in that way. You know, if it's going to be something that I don't have control over or something that I can't touch or whatever, I want to just, you know, go full bore and as much as possible. And so I was kind of disappointed with that. So I decided to cash it out and take the hit on the taxes and the hit on the, on the withdrawal, you know, penalty. So, yeah. so that was a retirement plan. Now, you know, mm -hmm. taking the hit on the withdrawal penalty, paying the tax mm -hmm. in hindsight, was that a good decision? Oh, geez. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. So, like so you made more on the income properties through our network than you lost on paying that tax and penalty. Yeah. And that's because of the stuff that you talk about a lot, you know, yes, there was cash on cash that was great, you know, but there was also depreciation, you know, writing stuff off your taxes. So, I mean, the, the overall return on investment has been phenomenal. It's, I, I probably should have done it earlier, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but it was what it was. Yeah. So I bought, uh, like I said, about one in 16, one in 17. And then because I cashed that out, I bought, oh, about one in 18. And I cashed out at the very beginning of, of 19. And I, yes, yeah, so of 19 and I bought three properties in 2019. And then last year I didn't buy any properties. And then I just closed on my uh, seventh one in January, just this January. Fantastic. And yeah. you were kind enough to do a, uh, a surprise testimonial video for us. Uh, we sent out a, a link where people could give us a review. What I loved about yours is you were standing in, I guess, like an office room in your home, yeah. and you had all of our property tracker performers on your wall behind you of your properties. Yeah. I just yeah. I just love that. You know, yeah. I think it's, it's good to have, for, for me anyway, to have visual reminders of things like that. You know, it's really mm -hmm. important to say, you know, this, yes, this is, you know, a goal of mine. I need to like present this in front of me and yeah it's been kind of fun you know to have yeah. that visual reminder and and you know even though I'm not I, I wouldn't say super far along in my in real estate journey by any means it's fun to kind of see that wall slowly grow you know yeah that, that's it's great so, yeah, yeah. You more more posters on the wall mean more income for you right yeah I means closer yeah. to the goal yeah good good stuff yeah, good sure. stuff yeah. Andrew tell us a little bit about what you do for a living if, if you care to share it I, sure. I, we talked off air about it and I thought it was fascinating yeah. Yeah, so I'm a nurse. I actually got my nursing license over in Sweden initially, even though I'm from uh, the Pacific Northwest here. And now I work um, in a psychiatric hospital uh, here in the uh, greater Portland metropolitan area. And yeah, I really love it. You know, it's fun to work with people and to help people. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's exhausting mental work, you know, working with people always is. But it's, uh, yeah, it's really rewarding. And I think the team that I work with uh, certainly makes it so much better. You know, it's... It that, the that's people you great. work with really make or break, you know, the work that you do. So. Sure, sure they do. What I didn't know, uh, which you mentioned, is is your facility is an emergency mm -hmm. psychiatric facility. Yeah. I sort of never even considered there that there was such a thing. But yeah. given going on in the world the past year, maybe can you share some things with our listeners? Of course, not confidential things, but yeah. just in general, what's happening to people out there? Yeah, as you know, I mean, it's been a very, very rough year for most people in the United States and, and many people around the world, of course, too. Um, and folks who would normally be able to check in with their um, therapist or psychiatrist or whatever it would be along the way, 
have been bumped into the Zoom world. And that's very hard sometimes to not have that human contact and, and very hard to not. Um, it's just a different relation. You know, a relationship is very different over the web than it is in person. And I think a lot of people kind of fell off, you know, a path where they were already on that was kind of a, a supportive structure for them and got into the Zoom world. And it just it's, it begins falling apart for them. And when the you know mental health starts falling apart for them, the, the rest of their world starts falling apart. And so I think a lot of we've seen a lot of that, I think, over the last year folks who otherwise would never probably need a a psychiatric emergency department seek help and service because they're in crisis. How about like, I mean, you deal with sadly, you know, suicide attempts and Mm -hmm. and things like that. Have you seen maybe just anecdotally, because I know empirically there has been an increase given what's going on, but anecdotally, like, what have you seen? What can you tell us? That's a good question. I, I don't know that I have, honestly. You know, I mean, again, we've been to psychiatric hospital there. I've been working there almost three years. And so that's always been a daily part of the work, you know, so I, I haven't really noticed there being like, oh, someday I don't deal with somebody who's suicidal. And some days I do, you know, every single day, there's somebody I'm working with who is struggling with um, thoughts of suicide. And that's just, uh, I'm glad the hospital's there for them. You know, what can right. I say? Yeah. Sure, sure. Here's kind of a, a superstitious aside, and I don't know if you have anything to say about this, but you just made me think of it. For years, I've heard about these um, possible wives' tales about the moon cycle, right? And I'm just curious, mm-hmm. do people talk well, about that in your profession? The, you know, the classic, like, the moon, classic, like lunar. Have more issues. And, you yeah, know. you know, the, the classic, like, you know, the sun, the moon's out, that's the lunatic, right? The, the, right, yeah, the idea yeah. of that, you know. Oh, that's where um, the word comes from. I never even yeah. thought. Yeah, oh. totally. I don't know. I mean, it's funny when when there is an odd day, people say, oh, it's a full moon, you know, so that there's, I don't know if it's superstitious, but there's, it's ironic and it's funny. And sometimes it does seem to line up with that. But, you know, again, we, we have days that are less crisis than other days, it feels like. And they're not always lining up with the lunar cycle that I'm aware we, of. We've all heard those things that, you know, emergency rooms fill up on full moon nights and mm-hmm. DUIs increase and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah. I, I just was kind of wondering. I thought I'd just ask that as an aside. I haven't noticed it, Jason. Yeah, but uh, it's entirely possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In terms of uh, real estate, where are your properties? So the first one I bought was in Montgomery, Alabama, and that was again mm-hmm. back in 16. I think you guys were in that market really briefly, and then um, it just didn't quite work out. The relationship with the provider over there was kind of fell apart. Yeah, we, we didn't happens. like that provider too much, but you know, we've, yeah. we've had some bumps in the road. I hope you weren't one of them. Uh, so, you no. know, some have worked out fine. As, as Sarah said, I got in and I got a good one. So, uh-huh. um, so that was great. So I had my first one there, and then you all were no longer in that market or recommending that market just because the, you know, whatever, the relationship, the inventory, whatever wasn't there. And so I moved down to Jackson, Mississippi for the next five properties, yeah, down there. And those are primarily in Jackson, and one of them's in Clinton, which is just a suburb of Jackson. And that's, uh, that's probably been my best, my best property has been that Clinton, Mississippi property. It's been really good. And then the last one I bought here in January, I was back in uh, Montgomery. I figured I'd start... Um, trying to maximize my relationship with the uh, management company there. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I want to get, you know, a few more at least in Montgomery before I move to a third market. Right. Great. So you're in two markets now then, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Good, good stuff. And so your first one was five years ago. Now you're up to seven properties. Share some of the experiences or, you know, lessons learned, good things, bad things, whatever you want to share. And and, and also, I always want to ask, are there any tools you're using, um, you know, whether it be software or ideas or contractors or just, you know, anything like that without giving out necessarily oh, names? Fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. I understood. Yeah. I, you know, I, I've tried to let the professionals that I'm recommended by or to, to be the professionals. So I, you know, I work a lot, I work a lot of hours, I put a lot of overtime. So my ability to really engage in the day-to-day kind of stuff uh, has really been limited. And I don't have a desire to do that yet either. You know, I have a desire to really let the management companies kind of run those pieces and just monitor the management companies, you know, and if things don't look right on the page, I ask a lot of questions, you know. So for me, I don't want to be more engaged right now in day-to-day stuff with the properties. Someday I will, but at this point, I'm I'm working a lot right now. I'm enjoying the the work that I'm doing and my focus is on the work that I'm doing and I'll let my business be the business, but let the professionals be the professionals and do that part for me. And it's been an okay thing, you know, it's not been perfect like anything, like you you always say too, it's not a perfect thing, but it's uh, certainly better than everything else. It has right. been so far. Some of this stuff, you know, in that first Montgomery house that I bought back in 16, that one had two kind of bad tenants in a row. That's always tough. You know, thankfully, like I've mentioned kind of uh, before, I've always been just convinced that 
real estate was the vehicle anyway. So it didn't like derail me at all. I didn't get, I mean, it got discouraged. I mean, who wants to pay out money rather than receive money, but it didn't derail my, my plans at all. And I knew that, I knew that was a part of the business at times too. And unfortunately I hit that kind of in the first year of a couple, a couple rough tenants who just, and they didn't destroy the place, but they left it very dirty and filled with junk and, you know, there's costs involved in that turn, you know, and that wasn't very fun because the profits were shot for the year, but still it's been a good ride so far. One of the things that I didn't, you mentioned this too, being able you know, paying attention to the management companies. That was one of the things that, and that particular property that I'm mentioning there went over to a national company for management after the particular company that I originally bought it from and had managing it transferred all of their properties over this national company as well. I just went along with for the ride on that one. And that was dumb. That was, that shouldn't have happened for me because um, they didn't actually even have an office in Montgomery. And so how can you pay attention to a property or, or that if you're not even like geographically located there? So that was, that was a little rough. And I think I got a little burned on that one and, but learned a lesson, you know, and uh, then got a, a local company there. That's been, uh, been great so far. I've been enjoying it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they've, been, they've been really on top of it. So are you, uh, you know, really looking at your property management statements every month? And uh, it sounds like you're holding the managers to account if something doesn't look right, if, you know, you're concerned that you're paying for stuff you don't need to pay for, sure. or, you know, costs are too high, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about costs are too high, because I, I don't know enough yet in those markets, what things, you know, cost, you know, like for doing stuff on my own home here in, in Washington, you know, I do a lot of my own construction work, I do a lot of my own repairs and those kind of things. So for me, things are, you know, the cost of materials and a little bit of my time. So I don't really know what the market costs are for a lot of things, just to be honest with you. But it's interesting, you know, with real estate, you, do, you don't a lot of times know if something's happening until after it happens, and you get the statement at the end of the month, and you're kind of like, oh, you know, I'm, having a conversation after the fact, which isn't always the best time to have a conversation, but you don't always know about the information or the, the situation um, in the moment that it's happening. There's been a couple of times where like a larger expense is coming up and you know, on, you know, right away, you know, the management company lets you know right away, hey, there's something that's going on here that we need to have sussed out and see what, what the repairs are going to be. But um, for the most part, it's been, yeah, it hasn't been too bad. Sometimes I'll see like, oh, somebody didn't pay. And I will call the management company and like, what's going on? You know, <laughs> tell me about this. You know, what have your action steps been since, you know, this has been going on for a month, you know, um, rather than like, oh, what are we going to do now? Because their job is to know in the moment and to be responding to things in the moment. Yeah. You know, the, the thing I always uh, have noticed and I, I say is that, you know, even when you have a uh, an expense that's a surprise or, you know, a manager who's a little too liberal on the spending money, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still better than those Wall Street investments where you just don't know what's going on. I mean, yeah. here you notice it, but mm -hmm. there you know, you just get your return at the end of the deal or along the way, right? And you look at your stock portfolio and you have no control over what they're spending. You have mm -hmm. no control over whether uh, like Intel, for example, just got nailed with, I think, a $2.1 billion patent infringement lawsuit or something like that. I just read about that. Yeah. And, you know, that affects all the shareholders. You know, if you own stock in Wells Fargo and they got like a scandal every week there, you know, and they're getting fined by the government, they're paying these giant fines to the SEC. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really affect, at least not very much, the executives it affects the shareholders. They right. pay the bill for that stuff. Right. The regular, the regular person on the street. So unfair. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the other things too, is aside from being just, you know, a frivolous expense that nothing's done on, if there's an expense, you're still improving your property. <laughs> so it's right. almost like the money's still going back into the investment, which even though it doesn't feel good, like I said earlier, to, to pay money, it's much better to receive money than it is to pay it. But it's still, there's some, uh, you know, some, some comfort in knowing that the money's going into your investment rather than just loss, you know, which it is in the Wall Street side. That's a good point. You know, um, a few people think of it that way. So when you get an expense, at least you're not paying for the executives and their private jets, yeah. and you're not paying for corruption necessarily. Sometimes you might, but you got to watch that, obviously. But the ability for a property manager to be corrupt is dramatically lower than it is for a CEO or a fund manager to be corrupt, right? I would expect so. I mean, again, the, the degrees of separation are much farther with the Wall Street you know, scenario, um, right. where I'm a phone call away from my, my management person.
Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Any other experiences or tools you want to share? Any Anything people can learn from? Any uh, tool? Yeah, you know, I've just noticed like my first house that I bought in Montgomery, Alabama was, it was probably a C-class property, right? You know, I know you've talked about, you know, try to stay away from the C-class properties and get into the B-class and the A-class properties, just a lot less work, a lot less trouble, you know, better tenants, all that kind of stuff. And, and it's true. You know, I, I can't say that it's not true. Um, I probably was a little excited back in 2016 about the pro forma and, and the, you know, the starry eyed uh, gains of cash on cash, you know? So every one of my properties, interestingly enough, every one of my properties has been increasingly more and more expensive as I've gone along. So the first property I bought in- uh, In, in like, other words, you're buying there. more expensive properties. Correct. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. Now, now is that, is that due to the appreciation that's been happening or are you buying, are you up leveling the quality of your properties? I think it's just been up leveling the quality, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, there's been definitely the, the last year particularly has been an incredible amount of appreciation, but I've only bought one property, you know, but again, the first one I bought was like 68,500, right. And rents were 825, which is phenomenal. It was great. And when they're paying, it's great, right? That's a, that's a phenomenal cash flow. But again, the level of tenant can be one who, you know, leaves without paying and causes a, a more expensive turn, shall we say. Mm -hmm. uh, but the last property I just bought was like 131.9. So I'm um, still a relatively inexpensive property. Yeah, honestly. that's, that's really inexpensive. And that's, again, that's in Montgomery as well. And Montgomery. Not sure what the cash flow is going to be on that one. Probably really close to $200, maybe just a, a hair over $200 with all the, um, you know, incidental in, but still that's, I mean, I can't get that on wall street consistently year after year after year. There's no way, you know, right. there's no way, maybe in a, maybe in a boom year. Right. But there's yeah. no way I can do that otherwise. And, 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 so, and um, that boom can retrace and go backwards very quickly right. on wall street. It can sink real quick. Yeah. With the real yeah. estate, it, it just not that volatile, you know, so that's yeah. a lot better. Yeah. So, so it's been good, you know, I, and I think I remember um, one of your guys who lives in Augustine, who's kind of a provider of newer construction out there. I can't mm -hmm. remember his name. It was the surfer guy. Yeah. He talked a lot about that too. When at the Meet the Masters, I think in 2018 or 2017, I went to both of those as well. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking, he was one of the speakers and he was talking about how he went from a lot of properties that many of them were lower quality, lower price to consolidating to fewer properties that were much more valuable properties, um, mm -hmm. still cash flowing, still, still a great investment. But I remember him talking about that transition and that, that really resonated with me just with my brief experience in the, in the C-class property kind of game. I thought, yeah, well, getting up to the B-class um, makes a lot of sense. So yeah. most yeah, of the properties I, are you know, B-class properties. I, I agree. And, you know, I, I think the thing I want to just say about that again, so everybody knows is, look, you can make money in anything. Okay, you can make money in F class properties or A class properties, right? But we find that for the tolerance of most of our clientele is that they, they like the better properties. They just have better experiences with them on the whole. There are certainly uh, those out there who are kind of the bargain hunters that want those El Cheapo properties. They've got great numbers on paper. And if they pay more attention to them, they can work. They can do great with them. But by and large... The A and B class properties tend to work out better for, at least for our people, we find. Yeah, I've done a little bit of the, I can't remember all of it right now, but but I think they're pretty close to each other, pretty neck, the B class properties and the C class properties right now. But again, you know, I, I think I went into real estate investing already knowing that it was the vehicle I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. the, the difficulties that a C class pre present is not something that I was like afraid of. You know, I wasn't like, I wasn't worried about the tenant who's going to trash my property. I just, I was never afraid of that. I don't mean that in a bad way. Just, I was mm -hmm. always exposed to real estate, you know, from a, from a younger age too. So there was no hindrance or, or barrier for me to get into real estate and to be worried about those properties. You know? sure. And I'll be honest, yeah. you know, I talk with a lot of folks too at work, um, you know, a lot of nurses who are in the place where they could probably, they have some expendable cash. They could probably get into real estate investing too, if they want to. And I certainly promote this style of investing. I enjoy it, you know, and it makes a lot of sense to me and it's been well for me. I always tell them too, you know, that, yeah, there's risk, in, but the people that I work with, the people on your team that I've worked with, you know, you, Sarah, the, the folks that I've connected with at the, um, the meetings that you have, the, the mm -hmm. events that you have, you know, the conferences and, sure. the, and all the management companies and, and, and that too, you know, everybody is a professional. Sometimes the management companies don't do a good enough job and, and you decide if you want to stick with them and, you know, hope they get better or you, or change that. But, 
but it's not like I'm working with a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing. Right. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what's that's so comforting. You know what I mean? It's like going in with novices, you're like, Ugh, you know, but going with somebody who's been doing it for a long time and understands the questions to ask, it just takes so much for me, the risk also away, you know? Just dealing with people who this is what they do all day long, you know, the mortgage people, the the buyer's broker in in the market, you know, all of those things. They're just they're just all professionals. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Thank you for that, by the way. That's a that's a compliment to us, obviously. And, you know, I'll tell you, Andrew, that's the reason I got into this business back in 2003, 2004. It's mm-hmm. because I tried to do this myself. And mm-hmm. it was so difficult. I mean, you know, I had been in traditional real estate all my life up until that point. And then I tried to become a nationwide investor. I couldn't get return phone calls. I was uh, flying around the country. I was meeting with people who didn't know anything about investing. A lot of them were just a bunch of schlocks, frankly, you know, or worse, they could be just really sleazy and unethical too. I thought we have the greatest investment of all. And yet there is no easy system to take advantage of it for people. I thought there's got to be a business here. (laughs) So I basically became my own first customer and created the business out of that. So uh, it was out of necessity, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what entrepreneurs do. You know, they, they notice a need and a hole in the marketplace and and then they fill it, you know? So yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. They have a vision for it. Yeah. They have a vision for it and they, uh, and they make it happen. So that's great. Yeah. Totally understand what you're saying there because I've always been kind of a nuts and bolts kind of a guy. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, you have people who, envision this oh there's a problem i see this this i envision a solution for this problem you know i've always been the one who said okay tell me what your solution is let me make it happen you mm-hmm. know i've always been kind of like that guy i'm just not a visionary thinker and that's it is what it is but definitely a, a rubber meets the road how's that going to get done that's pretty much what i've done and so again having your system already in place was perfect for me you know mm-hmm. i don't need to envision a new pathway I, just, I say oh that makes great or that's that's a great pathway let's let's just make that happen mm-hmm. so, yeah. yeah fantastic fantastic hey i'm curious where in uh, in sweden did you live so I was two years down in Stockholm when uh, my wife and I, we lived down there for two years. And then mm-hmm. um, when we were going to have our son, we moved up to the north of Sweden, it's uh, Piteå, Sweden, which is pretty far north overall. Not quite as far north as where you were in the ice hotel, which I visited uh-huh. before. Um, right, yeah. But, that, um, that, that was such hour, a neat trip. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty amazing up there, honestly. Yeah. So it's about a five-hour drive south of that, which is still very hard, far up, you know, probably about an hour and a half drive south of the Arctic Circle, roughly. Wow. I was moving there for about five years. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I shoveled a lot of snow in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I couldn't do that, but, uh, but for some, it works good yeah. stuff. Well, anything else you want to say to wrap it up? Do you have any questions about any of the, uh, you know, the techniques that we teach or any, anything that you like that you want to talk through real quick? Yeah, I didn't, I hadn't really thought about the questions side of things, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I don't think I have a whole lot of questions right now. I, I again, you know, when I have questions, I just reach out to Sarah or or somebody at the at the team, and and usually they know exactly what I'm talking about and and can answer really quickly. So good um, stuff. Yeah, one of the things I did mention though, I think that would be that was kind of cool was that the whole business that you have there's a referral business. It's a business that you know connects you know buyers and sellers and and that. And and I just remember one time uh, Sarah, my investment counselor, told me not to invest in in a particular property that I thought was very interesting to me. Mm-hmm. She's like, yeah, just matching you up with that particular seller wouldn't be a good idea. They, they don't match your style. And that was that was interesting. And I was glad that she gave me that feedback. And she was right, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, as an investor, you don't you don't have the relationship with the seller you know, ahead of time, which is what you guys also do too. So that was just kind of an interesting uh, aside to all of this too, you know, steering Mm -hmm. you in the right direction, but also steering you away from the wrong direction, which was very helpful. Yeah, that's great to hear. And, and, you know, um, I I certainly take a long-term view of business and I, I hope all of our team members always do. We really don't, hire salespeople, you know, we hire counselors who really take a long-term view and, and want to make sure clients have good experiences. They hopefully are always doing the right thing for them. And, uh, you know, we, we just did a survey and I can't wait to read all, we do an annual survey and right. I can't wait to read all the results. I skimmed over some of them yesterday and, and they all looked pretty good. So, uh, I filled right, mine out, nice. Jason. Oh, you, you did. Go. Okay, yeah. good. Well, I'll look forward to seeing yours too. <laughs> good stuff. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for for uh, sharing your story with us uh, on behalf of all the listeners, because everybody really appreciates these client case studies and uh, we appreciate your business and uh, just want to wish you a very happy investing journey. And uh, again, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your experiences. Yeah. Thanks. I hope in some small way, this encourages other, other folks who haven't gone this route to, uh, to jump in because it's uh, it's been great. Thank you. So it much. will. Thanks again. 
Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.